Hey everybody, welcome to Chuck Yates Needs a Job, the podcast. I always wear a hoodie. I normally wear a hoodie, but when I have a badass hedge fund dude coming on, I got the hoodie so I can go all Bobby Axelrod on this. It's really cool today. I've got Harris Kupperman, Cuppy, and is it Praetorian Capital? Yes, it is. Well, welcome on and tell me what the hell a Praetorian is. Oh, yeah. Well, hey, thanks for having me on. Uh, Praetorian, uh, this goes back a long time, actually, but I had this view, and I'm a Roman history major, actually. I'm not a business major. Uh, I just found that no one really wanted to hire a Roman history major, so I had to get a second job. Uh, and it turned out I was better at this than history. But I had this view that we uh, would invest in a lot of small caps. I still do a lot of small cap investing. If you go back in time, the Praetorian Guard was there to help the emperor and you know, make sure that no one came at the emperor and tried to lop off his head. And they did some of the dirty work for the emperor. And that's kind of how we see ourselves. We're there to help small companies succeed and mainly keep them uh, safe from their own investment bankers. Um, and at the same <laughs> time, you know, the Praetorian Guard sometimes would get sick of an emperor and, you know, kill him and put the new emperor in place. And, you know, they always had this sort of latent fear that, you know, the emperors had that the Praetorian Guard would turn on them. And, you know, I think we have a very good relationship with the companies we invest in, but I don't want them to get too comfortable, you know, and if they do something that's immoral or, you know, something that hurts my personal interests or the interests of my uh, clients, uh, we're, we're going to take them out and shoot them and put new guys in place. And we're not afraid to have an activist fight. Uh, I'm not here looking for a fight, but I'm not scared of it either. And so, you know, that, that's kind of how we saw ourselves when we first started the fund. We're here to help, but don't screw us. <laughs> that's, that's awesome. I actually like that. That was one of the hardest things we had to do every time we would start a small oil and gas company was to go find a name because literally every name has been taken. <laughs> and I never, I never, ever vetoed a name except once when a CEO wanted to name his company Diablo Energy. And I'm like, we're going to go to Farmer Bob and say, can we lease your ranch for the devil? You know, and so we're not we're not doing that. We're not doing that. We'll do this really short, kind of, you know, 30 seconds a minute. Tell me life before you start Praetorian, because then I really want to jump into Praetorian and, and geek out on hedge fund stuff. Oh, my life. Uh, I went to boarding school at Phillips Andover in Massachusetts. Uh, my parents told me that uh, I could be emancipated and freed at age 15 uh, from Long Island, which is probably the worst place on earth, uh, if I can get myself into a boarding school. So I studied real hard, probably the only time in my life I ever studied for anything. And I got into Phillips Andover and made them pay for it. And I learned that when I escaped my parents, I, I kind of basically traded one form of uh, oversight for a much more authoritative uh, institutionalized oversight that had no, uh, you know, they're very rules based oversight. And so uh, I went to Philip Zandover. I went to Tulane afterwards, where you know it was one of the greatest experiences of my life. I, I just partied for five years, and while at Tulane, I, I really started focusing on uh, investing in stocks. Uh, turned out uh, I was really good at it. And um, my senior year of college, I started a hedge fund, uh, which turned out to be reasonably successful, somewhat bumpy but successful. Uh, along the way, I've done some other business uh, enterprises, and I find myself uh, in twenty. Uh, 19 restarting a hedge fund, and uh, that's that's where I am today. We're, we're almost 200 million of assets. This is our fifth year of running it. And I think my track record is one of the best in the world. Yeah, no, I uh, I was sitting there looking at it, and uh, first thing that came to my mind is, oh my god, he's a fraud. But dude, you've crushed it. I mean, first year 12 percent, couple of years above, you know, call it 130 and 15 percent this last year. That's pretty amazing stuff. I mean, our tell me how you, great. yeah. Tell me, tell me how you do it. How do you guys look at? Well, let me let me start here. Let's talk the structure. I think maybe this is a backdrop will will help. You know, I'm really really old, and back in the day, a hedge fund actually meant you were hedged. So you went out, you told your investors, "I'm going to get you absolute return, no matter what the market does, because we're going to pick our best ideas, but we're going to go 
be market neutral. So, you know, the market moves up, market moves down. You're betting on us to pick the right stocks, i.e. that's why it was called hedged, a hedge fund. And that used to be how these things operated. And of course, a hedge fund became a, a grab bag for whatever an investor wanted to do. So with that as a backdrop, kind of what are you guys doing? How do you look at the world? What's your philosophy? That sort of stuff. Well, I mean, we're sort of hedged, but not in the, the traditional sense. I mean, I'd say we're mostly just a long fund. Um, you know, we're hedged in that a lot of the positions offset themselves. Uh, but, but I'm playing long sided because the most you can make on a short is 100 percent. And most things don't go to zero. It's just a miserable way to try to make some money. And, you know, I, I see the world and say that uh, there's these things that I call inflections. Uh, you know, it's a situation where it's been forgotten by the industry. It's been forgotten about finance. It's usually been a pretty sad and miserable experience for many years. It's been starved of capital, starved of investor interest. And then there's something that uh, inflects the business and it gets better. Uh, you know, the most obvious one are cyclical industries. They just go in a sign curve. And Wall Street is really good at taking uh, Apple earnings and just extrapolating it for the next 10 years. And they're really miserable at taking a cyclical industry that may only be profitable two or three years every decade. They'll lose money two or three years every decade. And it breaks even the rest of the year. And it, Wall Street does, it does a terrible job of trying to figure out what the right price for that business is. Whereas the private markets are very good at uh, valuing these sort of assets in their sign curve. Wall Street's terrible. And that, that's what gives someone like me an advantage. But I'm not usually looking at these cyclical industries, though I do some of that. A lot of what we're looking at is stuff that's truly inflecting uh, dramatically better. And the word dramatic is the important uh, point. You know, we're looking for multi-baggers. Uh, I don't show up to work unless it's going to be a five-bagger at least. And uh, we're trying to do this in a situation where if we get it wrong, and we get a lot of them wrong, uh, we don't lose much money. Uh, you know, when expectations are very low um, and things get uh, better, uh, you make five, ten times your money. And when things uh, stay where expectations are, which is pretty shitty, uh, you get your money back after a year. And you say, you know, this thing didn't work like I thought it would. Some other excess, you know, some other factor that I didn't anticipate came in and whoops, I got my money back. And if you show up to every investment with a worst case scenario is whoops, I got my money back. And the best case is you make five or 10 times and your batting average is pretty good, like mine is, well, then you end up having, you know, some big, big returns. And now, that's really the core of what we do. Uh, we do some other things on the side, but, but that's really the core of it, is finding these uh, trends with long tailwinds that give you multi-baggers. And so how many of those investments will you have at a time? A hundred, two? What's kind of, what does the fund kind of look like on any given day? Oh, we're concentrated. I mean, look, there's not a lot of great opportunities out there. I mean, Wall Street has a bunch of guys who are much smarter than me that probably work harder than me. And they're going to figure this stuff out. Uh, most things are sort of fairly priced, give or take 20%, 50%, whatever. You know, so I wish we could be more diversified, but you just don't find that many opportunities. So we tend to be six to eight thematic ideas. Uh, sometimes we'll play a theme with one name. Uh, oftentimes it's a basket approach with two or three names. Uh, just because I I'm trying to play the theme and I don't want to bet on any one CEO. What I've learned is that racehorses just do their own thing. I mean, you ever watch a horse race? Sometimes the horse just stops and takes a piss. And, you know, I, I want to be betting on my theme, not, you know, the racehorse and the jockey. And so we'll use a basket approach. Sometimes we'll have idiosyncratic single ideas on. Uh, it's a combination. But, you know, right now we have four core themes on the book. Uh, it's, it's expressed through about a dozen uh, tickers that are substantial. We have a a bunch of other little piddly positions that don't really move the needle, but, you know, we just keep them on as tracking positions. But the core of what we do is four themes right now. And so can you throw one of those themes out? Are you okay discussing one? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, my favorite theme right now is uranium. Um, I think that we're going to have a massive short squeeze in uh, uranium. Uh, you have an industry that uh, is almost 15% of global electricity consumption. Uh, you have these uh, facilities, they're multi-billion dollar facilities, and they need uh, uranium to run. And we've had a, a deficit globally since 2019. That deficit has expanded over the last few years, uh, particularly with uh, the Russian invasion. Uh, 
you've seen a lot of Russian enrichment that came offline and you need uh, enrichment to make your, your uranium usable. I think we're going to have uh, some sort of crisis in the next uh, year or two where the world sort of runs out of uranium. And I think the price of uranium is going to go higher. I mean, I do a lot of supply and demand investing because it's, it's, it's very, you know, simplistic, I guess. You know, you have the supply, you have the demand. Uh, you know, the price goes uh, down when you have too much uh, supply and companies go bankrupt that produce the stuff. And then, you know, the supply cuts off and, you know, the price goes up and, you know, it goes to some crazy number as is a shortage. And then more things come online and they produce more. It's a sign curve. Uh, what I found with commodities is that the amplitude of these sign curves can be uh, insane, particularly when you have a small-ish market. In, in the case of uranium, you really have two major global producers. And you've seen a lot of the little guys go out of business, and it's going to take them a few years to come back online. Yet, demand for nuclear power grows every year as more uh, reactors come online. And uh, that uh, deficit is expanding, uh, particularly, like I said, with uh, Russian enrichment. But the, the final point I'd make on uh, uranium is that there's this entity called Sprott Physical Uranium Trust. Uh, we own a lot of shares. And it has a facility in place that issues shares and purchases uranium. And it's uh, since uh, the, the, the guys in Canada took it over, Sprott, uh, it's purchased about 40 million pounds of uranium, which is uh, very, very material in a world where, you know, demand is about 185 million pounds a year. Um, you know, and so it, it's basically taken... Uh, 20, 25 percent of global uranium uh, out of the market. And that, that, that's uh, accentuated uh, the deficit. And I think it will continue to accentuate the deficit. And as the price of uranium starts rallying, I, I would expect that it will issue a lot more shares. I expect it will uh, acquire a lot more uranium pounds and push the price higher in a reflexive feedback loop. Because the thing that Wall Street likes the most is when something goes up. And as it starts going up and as more people learn about the, the magnitude of the deficits globally, I think they'll buy uranium because uh, they're going to front run the utilities. And as they buy uranium and front run the utilities, it's going to sequester pounds and make the price go up. It's, it's very uh, reflexive. And I like these sort of situations. I think it's going to work you know, fabulously well. And you, you probably have a heavy duty dose of the world's going to get rid of all of its nuclear stuff in the next 27 minutes. You know, that kind of holding over its head. So maybe it's a little bit out of favor, too. I think it's very out of favor. I mean, <clears throat> it's one of those situations where five years ago, uh, nuclear power was terribly out of favor. Um, a lot of nuclear power plants were uh, scheduled to be shut down. Um, you had uh, nat gas in the U.S. at $2. So, you know, it was cheaper than nuclear power. And I think the, the world thought nuclear power was going to get phased out. And what we've learned is that nuclear power is not getting phased out. Uh, intermittent power from solar and wind is, you know, fine and good, but you need baseload. And uh, nuclear is the low cost, non-carbon baseload solution that everyone's been looking for. I mean, if the technology was invented yesterday, everyone would be super excited about it. But it comes. We say with, that we say that every day on the podcast. It feels like if we invented it today, we'd all be high fiving. Yeah. Yeah, but it comes with all this legacy baggage from sixty years, and uh, as a result, people thought these plants were getting phased out. So. If you were a miner, have you heard have you heard Joe Rogan's take on uh, nuclear? No, I Joe haven't. Rogan's take on nuclear, to your point, is it's not nuclear per se. It's that all these plants that had problems, Chernobyl, the one in Japan, Three Mile Island, they were all built in the seventies, and we just sucked at building shit in the seventies. It's like, have you ever driven a car from the seventies? It stinks, and so. He's always he's always saying it's U.S. manufacturing capability of the '70s problem, not a nuclear problem. He's yeah. probably right. Yeah, there's probably a lot of that. But look, even when the technology was terrible, no one really got killed by it. It's I mean, a lot more people have been killed in uh, you know nat gas plants and coal plants and all the other plants, but they don't make the news and no one's terrified of them. But you had this situation where if you ran a, a, a uranium mine, you thought the demand was going to decline. And so you said, why am I reinvesting this business, especially when it's losing money? Because, you know, the, the, the price of uh, uranium got into $20 a pound range and the cost to produce it stayed at 60. And so everyone just said, you know, the hell with this. And what turned out was that the, the demand was a lot more robust than anyone expected. And suddenly there's no uranium to be had. And I, I think the price is going to go to some insane level. Um, you know, we've just seen this uh, before, you know, if the price is 60 to break even on it, 
and you need a much higher price to incentivize someone to start a new mine. You know, it's $80, but it doesn't just go to 80 and stop because you have these reactors, you have this $10 billion piece of industrial equipment, and they say, if we run out, we don't produce any electricity. So they, they pay a higher price, 100, 200, 500. It doesn't really matter to them. It's not their money. It's the rate payers. They just pass it on. And we're talking about one or 2% of the cost of electricity anyway. So I think they're just going to chase the price higher and pay whatever the price is. And as a result, I think you have some super spike here. So, so two kind of wonky kind of investor type topics on this. Where did the idea come from? Were you reading Fortune magazine, watching TV, whatever? And then tell me kind of workflow around your shop on how you you work the idea to move it forward. And then when you when you tell me that, I'll, I'll hit you with the how are you playing it and how you know you playing it versus how I used to play things like that in private equity. Yeah, sure. So, I mean, look, I've known about this thesis for a very long time. In 2004 and 2005, I bought a bunch of uh, uranium miners. Back then, it was a pretty similar scenario. Um, I made amazing amounts of money. Some of these things were 50 and 100 baggers. I, I wish I'd held them the, the whole way. I'd be retired now. I, I sold too soon. Uh, I was a little kid back then, but I caught the theme and it was great. And, you know, when you make a lot of money on something, you kind of follow it because these cycles repeat. This is my second uranium cycle, you know. Uh, a lot of these industries, it's my third or fourth cycle now. And so I've just loosely followed it, but not closely because what happened is the price went really high. The price went from uh, $12 to 130 and they built a bunch of mines. And then there was a glut and it was terrible and everyone went bankrupt. That's how this uh, industry works. But, but I followed it. Uh, and in uh, 2019, it, it caught my attention that a number of very large mines went out of business. They tried as hard as they could to keep the lights on, but you can't produce something at a loss forever. And eventually they shut the mines. And I know that when you shut a mine, it takes a couple of years to turn it back on. And so it got me interested. But there was this glut and it was a big glut. You know, the Japanese after Fukushima, they turned off most of their nuclear power plants but they had purchase commitments. So they're buying this stuff and just dumping it into a warehouse. And you know, so all those pounds were getting sold back into the market at a loss by the Japanese. And you had all these other uh, pounds just sitting in warehouses. So you finally went into a deficit situation in 2019 as these mines shut. I looked at it and it's like, okay, that's interesting. I'll, I'm going to come back to it in a while. You know, it's, it's not like a let's do something. It's that's interesting. And, you know, we waited for that uh, uranium to get chewed through. The deficit was 30, 40 million pounds a year. And so, you know, 2019 was 30 or 40, 2020 was 40, 20 or, you know, it's just you, you watch it and you're like, that's interesting. And after you chew through over 100 million pounds, you go, OK, I wonder how much more is left in the warehouse. And then you start doing work, you know, but I, I, I was seeing on Twitter, these guys are like, wow, look, now's the time for uranium. I'm like. It's not time yet. Like, this, this is a warehouse in Japan that's just full of this stuff. You know, it's just obvious it wasn't time yet. The, uh, yeah, now I used to tell investors, I hate to sound like I'm on Sesame Street, but nothing cures low oil prices like low oil prices, and nothing cures high oil prices like high oil prices. And uh, it's the same but, in every so, commodity. It, exactly. Uh, it's all fun flows. I mean, I wish the Bitcoin miners would realize that too. Guess what, guys? But um, so how, so the way you play it from your hedge fund is you go, OK, I've got this macro event. I think we're we're short uranium. It's time to go. So you're buying you're buying one, two, three of the publicly traded miners. Are you doing any kind of private transactions? No, I don't do any privates. Um, I just own a physical uranium. Um, OK, look, uh, oil is different from uh, mining. Um, mining, if you have a producing mine, you have cash flow. It's like oil. A lot of these assets, they're not producing mines. They have a hole in the ground and they need money to turn it on. It's never going to be on budget. It's never going to be on time. There's always going to be permitting issues. And if you actually get it to work, uh, they're going to tax you and pro probably try to steal it from you. It's in some funny country. You know, the last cycle of uranium, I, I made a lot of money because I was buying these assets at 10 and $20 million valuations. And a lot of them were past producing mines that a billion dollars went into the ground and it all been impaired, you know, but it was still in the ground. The facility was still there and it's, it's rusting away slowly, but it's not really just like vaporized.
advertising. So, you know, you look at it and you're like, okay, I'm going to pay $10 million for this thing that they spent $500 million on drilling and $500 million on equipment. Like, sure, whatever. And maybe the equipment's a little rusty and they need $100 million to turn it on. But I know it's real. It's produced before. I have numbers. Now those sort of assets are a billion dollars. And so a billion dollars went in. It's worth a billion. It doesn't make any sense. It's not cheap to me. You know, and you turn it on, you do the numbers and it's just like, so you think the price of uranium is going to be 100. I'm paying 15 times uh, what I think the, the, the number will be if the mine starts on time and it's on budget and they don't dilute me anymore and they don't change the tax rules. And I mean, the price of uranium isn't 100 today, it's 50. You, you kind of like work backwards and you discount all the probabilities and you're like, man, this thing is really overvalued. You know, you just, and I've been through all the mining assets and there's people, friends of mine who will tell me I'm wrong and that's fine. That's what makes a market. But I am a curmudgeon value investor and I don't like taking risk. And, you know, I think one of the unique things that I try to do is not take risk, but have, you know, huge upside. And so I'm very disciplined and I looked at these assets. I just don't like them. Uh, and, and, and instead, I own physical uranium. I think there's a very good chance that, that the price of physical uranium goes to some crazy number for some short period of time. And I can exit it at that uh, crazy number. What I know is that if you have a mine, especially a startup mine, you have to contract with an offtake. And the offtake's going to give you a little piece of that you know, spike. But mostly, you know, that, 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 that piece, it's going to go to the offtake guy. It's going to go to your, you know, your Glencore, your Trafigura, or it's going to go to someone else in the middle or it's going to go to the end user who's locked in a price. It's not going to go to your little miner in Africa. That's just not how this game works. And so I want to capture that super spike. And these miners aren't going to capture the super spike. doesn't mean that the share price can't capture the super spike because shares can do anything. But they're not going to get that super spike to 500 or 1,000 that lasts for a few months while some utility panics and just you know buys uranium at any quote. Like, I'm going to get that. They won't. So I, I just own the physical and I can sleep well at night knowing that I own a commodity for less than the cost of producing it. And there's a huge deficit and historically good things happen to me when I'm in that situation. And I don't have to quantify what price I'm going to sell it way too soon. I always sell it way too soon and it doubles again. And then three months later, I look brilliant because it collapses. So that, that's my trade. And that's my biggest trade, actually. You, you know, you just laid out the thesis that so I got I got fired. We're, we're coming up on three years now. Uh, I got fired April of 2020. <clears throat> and, you know, shortly thereafter, I'm not that smart a guy, but, uh, you know, shortly thereafter, you know, one of the things that hit me just square in the face thinking about energy is, you know, the beta oil price just so dominates the performance of the assets that not, I'm making this up. 90% of the money that's invested in energy should just focus on the beta, just on oil price. Because if you're a cab, you own a cab company in Vegas, your input's gasoline, you should probably be long oil. Because if oil and gasoline prices go up, your business is going to suffer somewhat. Conversely, if you're a home builder in Houston, Texas, Probably ought to be short oil because when oil crashes, you're not going to be building a lot of houses. And it just seemed to me that we we should be focused on price as investors. And, you know, maybe a small amount of money can go chase alpha. To your point, if somebody's drilling better wells than somebody else, uh, they should do it. And I looked around for a way to do that. And the only thing out there is USO, which is I don't know if you've ever messed. What? There's a lot of ways to play it. I mean, well, you look. can play it on the you can play it on the NYMEX. Um, this was sort of crazy. I, uh, I mean, I'm a, a high net worth guy over at Morgan Stanley. I ran a private equity oil and gas fund for 20 years, and it took me six months to talk them into giving me a NYMEX trading account. But for for most for most people, you know, it's really USO, and USO is just horrible in terms of having its tracking error because it's rolling the contracts, et cetera. So I actually messed around. I drafted an S1 for an entity called True Tracker. I think I quote unquote solved how to do it. Um, and, you know, I was an arrogant little prick. I, uh, I drafted it with, you know, two of the big law firms and I didn't bring in a bank, right? Because I don't want them stealing my idea. 
And uh, so we get this S1 drafted file. We get comments back. It's in pretty good shape. And I take it to all the investment banks. And I got this look of, you're offering me a flow through entity in the energy business. I've, you know, I've burned my retail chain too often on that. Get out of here. So I never got it done. But uh, yeah. Anyway, I don't, I think that was ultimate narcissism, me just wanting to tell that story. But uh, it was also a, 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 a semi transition over to what are you thinking about oil and energy? Um, I mean, I'm very bullish oil. Um, it's, um, going higher because if you consume more of it than you produce, the price goes up until you produce more or you consume less. I mean, it's supply demand and the imbalance is going to be very high for the next couple of years because we have had minimal CapEx spending for seven years now. And, uh, it's not like you can just flip on a switch. A lot of the uh, services companies, uh, they don't have the capacity to start drilling today, even if you ask them to. We've also seen massive inflation in oil field services, which means your break evens are going up, which means that a lot of guys aren't even very well incentivized to start drilling right now, especially because uh, if you look at the curve out to 2025, it's sitting there at $68 and that's below their break evens in a lot of cases, especially when you add financing costs, which has just gone up a lot. And the, the net result is, I think, uh, you're not going to see much uh, spend on uh, production growth at a time when demand is growing. Uh, we, we've deferred this uh, for a year, really, because um, Biden liquidated the SPR. A couple other countries did similar things, and China shut themselves down. And both of those go in the other direction. Uh, you know, the, the SPRs are running on empty. They can go a little longer, but we're talking, you know, months, not years. And China seems like they're rebooting with a lot of stimulus. And the, I think the net result is a multi-million barrel swing uh, on the demand side. And I think you're also on the supply side. going to see a bit of supply growth out of the U.S. and some other places offset by uh, supply declines uh, from Russia. I think you might see no net supply growth uh, in 2023 which uh, I know is a contrarian view, but you know, I think you're going to see four, five, six million barrel uh, deficits uh, this year by the end of the year. And I, my, my favorite trade, honestly, is just go buy a, a, the, the December 23 future and close your brokerage account down and you know, <laughs> spend the rest of the year configuring your jet. I, I just think that's yeah. a... Or, or actually, I said that wrong. Uh, buy the call options on the DS 23 and then spend the rest of the year configuring your jab. There you go. I, I like that. That and then and, and in fact, you know, we'll go grab a beer at some point and I'll tell you about True Tracker. But in effect, that was the simplified trade. It really was embedding, you know, DS23, DS24, wherever you wanted to go into a unit. And then the unit price would in effect replicate whatever the market was quoting for DS23 or DS24. And that way it could be arbitraged and ultimately it would track uh, that price, you know, because you weren't rolling contracts. But, you know, I'll throw some stats at you, too, because I, I have a tendency to agree with you, you know, and th these numbers are never right because you can't get good data out of Saudi Arabia. But directionally, I think they're right. If you looked at like 2005 to 2015 or 2000 to 2012, something like that. Saudi Arabia ran about 50 rigs a year or 75 rigs a year. And that made sense. You know, you had maintenance on your fields, whatever. During, you know, the, the shale revolution in the United States and the oil price collapse, you know, which was Thanksgiving of 2014. And, you know, we touched, we touched, you know, call it $30 oil in there. We probably averaged like 40 I mean, Saudi amped it up. And at one point, I think they had 200 rigs running. And so, I mean, if they have this excess capacity that they talk about, why are they running that many rigs when oil price is that far down? So I, I don't think Saudi Arabia has it. Russia, war, uh, embargo, all that stuff. I think you're right. They ultimately, they, they've been the surprising one through the years of being able to maintain and grow production. You got to feel like that's going to stop. And one of the craziest stats, and I'm going to get it wrong because it's been years since I quoted it, but it's something like 2005 to 2015, 
if you took Saudi, U.S., and Russia out of the equation, you looked at the whole rest of the world, and we had, during that period, really high oil prices, and we had all the capital you could ever spend, and we had the most amazing technology everywhere. The rest of the world was actually down in production. It was very small. It was like down half a percent or something, which means if if it was there to be found or got out of the ground, they would have done it then, and they didn't. So I think you're right. I think the world's kind of tapped out, and you know what what's going to cause demand to fall? I mean, I guess I, I think almost a, a European recession's off the table. I think the warm winter saved them. Um, you know, we'll we'll see what happens in in kind of future years, but I, I just don't know what's going to hit demand. All these countries will just print money again. They'll give stimmies to people. Like I'm not really worried. I mean, look, I I've got money, so maybe I'm a little different. But if the price of oil goes up, I, I don't stop going places, and I don't think in America people stop doing stuff and going places. I mean, when oil went crazy and crack spreads absolutely blew out uh, a year ago. Gasoline consumption barely dropped in the U.S. It dropped a little, but it barely dropped. And people in the end, they just want to go on with life. I mean, look what's happening in India where demand's going parabolic. I mean, it's from, you know, look what's happening in Africa. Demand's uh, exploding. I I just think that in the end, countries hit their S-curve and demand explodes and population keeps growing and 6 billion people that don't have microwaves and air conditioners and all this other stuff, want the same standard of living that I have. And I believe in human progress. And eventually they're going to buy all the same toys and they're going to need uh, energy. And energy takes many forms, but one of them is uh, petroleum liquids. And uh, I just think you're going to continue to see uh, demand growth at a time where you're not going to see any supply growth. Um, I mean, you could look around the world at where supply comes from. I mean, Iran has a bit of extra supply, Venezuela, but I mean... Are you going to make a five-year CapEx uh, investment in Venezuela? I know Chevron's you know, tinkering around the edges, but do you want to put real capital into that place? I mean, they change the rules every weekend. And you start looking around the world, I think you're going to see a lot of growth in offshore. Uh, it's the one place that really you haven't seen a lot of uh, spending yet, especially in some of these uh, frontier markets, the Guianas, the Surinams, the world. I think you're going to see uh, net growth, but that's long cycle and that's five years out. I don't know what solves the problem in 24. No, I think you're right. Let me throw one kind of curveball at you a little to get your take on, because I agree with you. I think most people should be playing the commodities. So let's do, you know, DS 23 or DS 24. And I remember, I just remember my mom listens to the podcast. So mom, DS is December. So, you know, <laughs> December 23, December 24, when the, the contract matures. But uh, here's here's my thing is if we look at publicly traded oil and gas companies, let's say they trade at three or four times EBITDA. I mean, at those type multiples, I am not incented to give you more EBITDA. You know, I uh, I was talking to one of the CFOs of one of the big independents. And I go, how's life? He goes, man, it's great. I send out dividend checks and nobody bitches at me. And the the thing, though, that I want to get your take on is at three to four times EBITDA, I don't think America has the incentive to grow. But if we see a big need and prices ramp up, I think the one I don't think this play happens in 23 or 24, to your point. But the play could happen that all of a sudden we're valuing these companies at 10 times EBITDA and we throw a lot of rigs at it. And then does that cause a lot more oil prices drop. So I'm not, so I'm wondering if on your trade, we need to go DS 23, DS 24, and at least have a basket of independent producers in case we see multiple expansion there. What do you think of that? Or is my career as a hedge fund guy over? No, look, there's a lot of ways to play a bull market. And I don't know if anyone knows the right way to play a bull market. Um, I'm a conservative guy. I'm playing it my way. I'm not going to say that owning producers is the wrong way to play it. I, I own one producer, but um, most of what I own in oil is just physical oil. I own uh, futures options um, in massive size. I own uh, December 25, uh, massive size and futures options. I own uh, the front of the curve. I own BNO, which is the ETF. And uh, I feel pretty strongly that I'll be earning some roll yield uh, starting next month again, which is great. 
because for a very long time uh, last year, you were earning two to three percent a month roll yield, which really amplifies your returns. Um, that's really how I'm playing it. You know, in, in one leg, I, I own some, uh, you know, DS twenty three too. So don't think I'm not, you know, putting my money where my mouth is. But I, I own a lot more front of the curve, and I own a lot more uh, the at least notional value of those future call options because it's, it's just a really cheap uh, right tail. But the other way I'm playing it is uh, oil field services. I, I, you know, you asked me at the very beginning, uh, hedge fund. What does that mean? Well, I like to hedge on the long side. Put it this way: one of these trades has to work. Either the price of oil screams out of control, or hundreds of billions of dollars get spent on oil field services, and maybe the price of oil does not scream out of control. But my oil field services do. I think there's a very good chance they both work. Uh, but there's also a good chance that one really dramatically works and one doesn't. But I don't see a scenario where neither works. And I like trades like that because I'm very well hedged. I don't know which one's going to work better, but I don't see a scenario where neither one works. And like I said, I think there's a very good chance they both work. So I own oil field services, uh, particularly offshore, because I think onshore, there's legacy supply, there's legacy infrastructure, you know, there's frack stacks, there's drill rigs. Maybe they're older. Maybe, you know, they're sitting in a warehouse for five years and no one's looked at the thing. But you could bring supply online at a certain price. Uh, when it comes to offshore, a lot of this stuff's been scrapped. Uh, the technology's really changed a lot. Uh, you know, you can use a, a, a fifth gen uh, rig, but no one's going to. They're barely going to use the sixth gen. Everyone wants the seventh. And so, you know, when it comes to uh, uh, you know uh, OSVs, the offshore supply equipment, if you don't have dynamic positioning, no one wants you near their rig because you might crash into the rig and have a health safety accident. So the, the equipment's become legacy. And I bought a lot of this equipment at 10 cents on the dollar of, of uh, the, the original cost. And remember, a lot of this stuff was paid for in 2006 to 2014 dollars. And you know, I don't think you could build a, an offshore rig for the same price as it cost in 2006. And a, a, as a result, I, I think your replacement cost of this stuff is a lot higher. And I don't think anyone's going to replace it because you can go out there and buy Valeris at 20 cents on the dollar of replacement cost, or you can go spend a billion dollars on an eighth gen. I think you're just going to buy Valeris. Uh, or maybe you're going to not buy Valeris because they're the biggest, but you're going to buy one of the little guys that it technically is for sale. I mean, that's their exit. They have three rigs. They're subscale. They have to be sold to someone. So I think that's uh, really the way to play it. I think what's happening in Guyana and Suriname and Namibia and some of these other offshore jurisdictions with huge discoveries, um, I think you're going to see just a lot more capital expenditure. You don't have to worry, you know, the U.S. onshore, you, you take a lot of risk here from a political standpoint. I mean, we're first world, but I don't think we're any safer than third world. Uh, you know, they could have a carbon tax on you. They could have an excess profits tax. I mean, the U.K. just did it. If Britain does it, anyone can do it. Um, they can tell you you can't build a pipeline here. Yes, I, I mean that that's the that's the biggie. Yeah, and you end up with stranded equipment and stranded uh, resource. Whereas if Guyana changes the rules on you, and I'm sure they will, they'll raise the taxes. That's the history. But they'll raise the tax a bit, and then everyone will complain. They'll stop drilling, and then they'll lower the tax. And it'll just be this cycle. But in the end, if, if Guyana gets really hard to operate in, you pick up your drill ship and you float it to Suriname. I mean, th those guys are going to fight for the equipment or you take it down to Brazil. Like it, 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 you have this mobile piece of equipment. And I think that's just a much better place to be. I'd much rather that than a frack stack in Oklahoma. Plus, you'd have to go to Oklahoma. That sucks. The, um, <laughs> I didn't well, say that. Yeah, <laughs> that was me. That was me. I'll take it. Um, if we're wrong about this, because I'm kind of I'm, I'm right there with you on the uh, the super cycle, super cycle for oil. If we're wrong. Why are we wrong? What did we miss? What do you think happens? Uh, the only way you end up being wrong is uh, if they lock the world down again. I mean, we saw them take 10 million barrels out of demand. Uh, in, in you know March of uh, 2020, they took 30 million barrels out of demand. Um, they could do that again. They could lock us down for anything because they've already proven they're willing and able. That's the thing that really scares me. But that just defers the thesis out two more years. Um, my drill ships will still be there. Maybe my uh, DS23 is going to hurt, but my drill ships are still there. And that's why I say I have this barbell approach. Because if that really does happen and my DS23s uh, lose me some money, 
man, they're going to be really hurting for oil in 25 and 26 and 27. I've always told people that follow the industry, I've always said that is the single greatest event because we were able to run the experiment. We literally shut down the world and we were still using, call it 65, 70 million barrels of oil a day. I mean, and that is a shutdown world. So if you're telling me that we're going to get rid of oil anytime soon, we we've got data to show otherwise, because, yeah, that was you're right. And I think 2008 is a great example. I mean, you had the 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 greatest economic crisis really since 1929 or, you know, the Great Depression, 29 to 34. What did oil demand do? In Q1 of 2009, it was down a few million barrels. By year end, it had almost fully recovered. For the year, it was down 2%, 1.5%. Like, it was like 800,000 barrels. Yeah, it wasn't a lot, that whatever that year was. Yeah. But I mean, I mean, think about it. You know, you had a couple of countries that truly went bankrupt, as in like their currency was zero. They couldn't buy oil. They couldn't, you know, you know, bring supplies in. Like everything that could go wrong went wrong. And Demand barely dropped. I mean, it, it fully recovered. It was a six, nine month thing and it was over. And that was it. And a year later, it got back to 90. Yeah, no, I, I think you're right. I, You know, the history of my career. So I, I joined out of business school, Stevens, and started doing energy. Let's call that 90, fall of 94. I mean, literally my whole career, oil demands up one, one and a half percent a year. Except Every for year. 08, 09, and it wasn't it wasn't down much to your point, you know, outside of the pandemic year. So, so yeah, let's let's look at a bad scenario. Oil demand drops two uh, percent, so that's two million barrels, but you still have a three million deficit. I mean, you're just going to keep draining and draining this year. Um, you know, like oil demand's down too. That's just global SPR. It doesn't even add China in. And yeah, we were marginally oversupplied for the back half of the year. That's why the price of oil dropped into the 70s. But I don't know. I'm just really, really bullish on this. And I know that there's uh, some supply common in places and there's a lot of wild cards out there. But I'm not particularly worried. Uh, Maybe I'm just due to get hurt. (laughs) There we go. There we go. No, I'm right. I'm right there with you. And I actually feel like I have some some distance from it, not managing money every day like I used to. I could actually think about it and 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 have some distance. But it's that because I think what's underappreciated too is, and it'll be more pronounced going forward, is you look at CapEx numbers, they've been lower, like you said, for the last seven years. Start taking CapEx numbers that are flat from the previous year and add some inflation into it, it's actually worse. And we're seeing ridiculous shit out in the oil field. I have a buddy that does electronics type stuff and a little sensor that he used to pay $250 for, he had to pay $5,000 for him recently. So it's it's not just your, you know, 7% inflation. There's some real stuff going out there. Oh, going oil on out there. inflation's gone crazy. I mean, and it's everything from drill bits to drill fluid to, you know, downhole steel to frack sacks. I mean, even sand is going up. And when does sand ever go up in price? Like everything's going up in price. And I mean, labor's going up, but that's probably the piece that's going up the slowest. I mean, oil field inflation might be running 50%. I mean, I'm really focused on what's happening offshore. I mean, a modern OSV last year it was nine thousand dollars. The uh, the opex was nine thousand. It cost you nine thousand a day. Now it's forty thousand. I mean, what is that going to do to your budget? You, I mean, you, you designed your project and you said, okay, nine thousand. Maybe you know, maybe it's going to be eleven thousand next year. Like no one thought it was going to forty, but you try to get a you know a large deck OSV or you try to get an anchor handler, you try to get any of this piece of equipment that. It was all scrap. They don't even exist. I talked to, I went on another guy's podcast yesterday. He's an oil field service guy. And we we talked about it. There, there isn't really a technology out there that in hindsight, you'd be able to say, okay, we were able to grow supply because of this. I mean, back in 05, 07, we were doing some great things with natural gas, horizontal drilling, fracking. It was a disaster to try it on an oil well. But you could see, hey, if we figure out how to keep the the formation open with the right kind of sand, et cetera, 
If we replicate this on oil, okay, maybe we can double production in the United States. You at least had a hope. There's not a hope technology out there. I think we've we've uh, we've hit everything we can with the big hammer. And I, you know, if we double production in the United States over the next ten years, I literally think the only way we can do it is price and way more rigs. There's not a technology that's going to be a panacea to do that. No, the only place I think you've seen uh, real advancement is ultra deep water where, you know, the last cycle in 2005 to seven, they really couldn't get some of this really, really deep stuff. And the technology has gotten better. But even then, it's just on the margin. It's not really, you know, like opening up the Permian like you're talking about. Well, we're talking about a couple million barrels, maybe, but it takes five, 10 years to build it all out. Like this isn't fast cycle at all. This isn't going to move the needle. Yeah. Well, Cuppy, you were cool to come on. This has uh, been a blast. How do people find you <laughs> if you want people to find you? How's that? Uh, well, you could go find me on Twitter. I think that's a starting point, at uh, hcuppy. Uh, I have a blog. Uh, uh, it's called Adventures in Capitalism. Uh, it's free, so you, you get what you pay for. Uh, I write when I have something to say, and often I have nothing to say. Um, but, you know, you should sign up for that. So give me your email. I won't spam you, I promise. And then if you want to learn more about my fund, go to PrayCap.com. But but only do that if you're accredited. Gotcha. Gotcha. Well, this has uh, been really cool. I appreciate you having me on. It's been good.